running a series of our public programs and distinguished lectures at the Clinton School. I'm Skip Rutherford, the Dean of the School, and I want to say a special thanks to Patrick Kennedy and Nikolai Pippa for the fine job they did in putting together these programs. A couple of special guests. Anybody in the world, and that's Betty Bumpers. <laughs> and my personal hero and the founding dean of the Clinton School, the former governor, congressman, state representative, of the United States Senator, and the former director of the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School in Harvard, Dean David Pryor.
took another different direction in his life and went to the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Uh, this is a very important institution uh, that was inspired by President Kennedy. Uh, they have one of the most distinguished lecture series in the United States there, uh, the John F. Kennedy Forum, soon to be eclipsed by ours, right there. Right. And uh, he uh, then took another turn uh, in 2004 and went to become the president of the Motion Picture Association of America. I asked him earlier what his affection for politics and rough, tum rough and tumble life was. He loves controversy. And he said, please ask anything controversial you want during the question and answer period. He loves that. Uh, he must like it because it's, it's been a tough role the last couple of years with the MPAA. They've had to deal with a number of issues. Uh, he's had interesting experiences. One of them had to do with the issue of film piracy and uh, the issues around uh, uh, property issues about uh, the types of materials, video, motion pictures, etc. Uh, one of his experiences was actually to debate one of the former Grateful Dead members in a public forum over that issue. So, like I said, he loves he loves excitement. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here. Uh, for those of you who watched the Oscars on Sunday night realize what an extraordinary enterprise the motion picture industry is in the United States. The uh, incredible entrepreneurship, imagination, creativity that comes in that field. Uh, and uh, he's uh, enjoyed very much his tenure as the chief spokesman for the Motion Picture Association of America. And we're happy to have him with us today. We're going to, he's going to give you about 15 minutes of comments, and then we will open the floor uh, for questions and answers. This time, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dan Glickman. Well, thank you, Gary, for that very introduction. Betty Mumpers, it's such an honor to see you here. My mentor, David Cryer. Not, not only did I succeed him at Harvard, where he was almost uh, knighted for whatever, eligible for sainthood and everything else, and, and I had the same secretary that he had, uh, Julie Schrader, and, and she would always say, well, David wouldn't do it this way. <laughs> but anyway, and Barbara, of course, as well, who were quite a team, but uh, it's a great honor to see him. He also helped me get my job as secretary of agriculture. And there are a lot of friends in this room that I've just, I'm just delighted to be here. You know, I, I was here two and a half years ago when I, my feet were under four inches of water during the uh, dedication of the uh, library. And everybody's nodding like they remember that at the event. But you know, for people who didn't like the weather, you wouldn't have remembered it as much without that. So it's a good way to, to uh, remember it. It was a great event. A lot of friends in this room. I'm looking down here. I see Margaret Willock. And Margaret's husband, Carl, was the, I mean, he was president, I think, of Arkansas State University, or as we say, at my home state of Kansas, our Kansas State University, but you understand that I have to be that way here. But uh, Margaret's husband, Carl, was the special assistant to the president for agricultural policy. And, and prior to Margaret's husband, Carl was Marion Barry, a congressman. And so uh, 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 this kind of comes back to a little bit of the story, as Gary talked about. When I became Secretary of Agriculture, it was, a, it was a, not a stretch. I'd served on the Agriculture Committee all those years, and so I knew enough about agricultural policy. And so uh, uh, I got a call to come to see President Clinton. And uh, yeah, the, Leon Panetta, who was then the Chief of Staff, asked if I was interested in being Secretary of Agriculture. And I had just lost my election, so I would have been Secretary, anybody's Secretary at that point in time. So, so I go down to the White House, and the president, as you know, Bill Clinton, was not historically known as the most prompt individual in the history of the world. And so I waited seven hours and they told me, come back. So I came back the next night, and uh, uh, I met with President Clinton and Leon Panetta up in the upstairs area. And the president walked in, and he says, well, do you want to be Secretary of Agriculture? That was the question. And I said, sure. He said, great. And he, he walked, stands up like to walk away, and I said, well, sir, do you want to know what I'm going to do in this job? <laughs> and so he said, no. He said, I'm not too worried about it. He said, 
you have, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is sometimes the agriculture department doesn't get all the attention. The good news is that sometimes the agriculture department doesn't get all the attention. And he says, just remember this, there are two people in this White House operation that know very much about this issue. It's you and me, and as long as you remember that, you're going to be in great shape. And, and uh, that's kind of the way it was. He took special attention to it. And then when I was there for a while, Mary and Barry ran for Congress, and they called up and they said, there's this guy, Carl Willock, who's going to be the special assistant to the president for agriculture policy, which basically meant the guy who was going to spy on me and make sure I was going to do okay for Arkansas. But I was a pretty good politician, and I learned that if, if I befriended Carl and if we, we worked together, it would be fine. And he turned out to be the most remarkable mentor that I ever had, not only on agriculture policy, but just how to cope in the world of agriculture. And, and, um, and so anyway, I just am delighted to, uh, to, to see you here. And, and I'm delighted to be back in the library, and I'm delighted to be in a place where there's so many friends of Bill Clinton, who was such a great president and had such an impact on this country. I'm just telling you, I was a I have to be very nonpartisan in my current job, and that's because I represent the motion picture industry, and there are all these issues like First Amendment, free speech, anti piracy, trade, and quite frankly, uh, these issues tend not to be very partisan. But I do know this, Bill Clinton loved movies more than any other president in the history of the United States of America. He loved movies like, uh, we, I'm told my predecessor used to send him lots of movies. He saw every movie. He knew every plot of every movie. He not only read every book that was ever written, but he saw every movie that was ever written. And my son is a film producer in uh, Los Angeles who kind of predated me in this job. And my son, had, we got a call from the White House one night, and they said, the president's going to show you a movie. Your son's movie tonight. And the movie was a movie starring Eddie Murphy called Holy Man. I'm not sure there's anybody in this crowd that saw it. But if you did, you've probably forgotten it since then. <laughs> and so I called my son. I said, You've got to be so thrilled. They're going to show Holy Man tonight. And my son said, They can't do this. It's the end, it'll be the end of my career. It's the worst movie that I ever did. You can't let him do this. You've got to stop it. So, like a good parent whose kid worked them up, I called the White House and I talked to the social secretary and says, uh, is there any way to change the movie for him? He said, no, he wants to see Holy Man. And it was with Eddie Murphy. And so we went over there and we saw Holy Man. And I had seen it about, as a good parent about seven times. Already. And needless to say, it was a chore even for a parent to watch it at the time. <laughs> And the president is there, and all the people, you can see the people in the room fidgeting and everything else. And after it was over, he stood up and he thanked me, and he said he wanted, he know, he, he said he wanted to let me know that he thought there were very many good points in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just, but, it, but it's like, uh, what an amazing guy Bill Clinton is. Uh, all I have to tell you is, like, you know, working in the agriculture department, which often didn't get all the headlines. Although I must tell you, I went up a very, kind person took me on a tour upstairs and I, they have one picture of me selling oranges to the Chinese, which I thought was appropriate. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it, it was fascinating how much he knew about this business and whether it's the intricacies of the wheat or corn or cotton program or whether it had to do with forestry policy or the food stamp program or you name it. I mean, he knew more about it than anybody within my department. I had to keep up uh, with him in order to maintain my credibility with my own employees, which is, you know, a, 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 certainly a, a, a most interesting thing. So I'm just, you know, I'm delighted to be back here. And and I, you know, I've had a fairly interesting career. I don't know how many, how many of you are students in this room or the, at the school or anywhere else? Okay, because I'm going to direct a lot of my comments to you as well. I. I've had a fairly interesting career. Somebody asked me, what qualified you, as Secretary of Agriculture, to be in the motion picture industry? So, I, you know, when they first asked me this question, my wife said, well, just tell them what's the first thing people do when they go to a theater. They eat popcorn. You know, what, what else is there? You know, it's a food. Food drives our lives and wherever we go. Uh, and, uh, but it is an interesting phenomenon that if you look back at my own career, it has been marked by 
uh, a variety of things, including kind of moving along when things didn't necessarily go my way. And my folks, and I say this for the folks in this room, it reminds me a little bit of the story about there was a president of a major corporation who addressed a high school class. And he addressed the class and he said, now class, I have one piece of advice to give you. Just remember this, you got to jump when opportunity knocks. So one kid raises her hand and says, that's great for you to say you're president of a big corporation. Tell me, sir, how do you know when opportunity knocks? And the man says, you don't. And that's why you've got to keep jumping all the time. <laughs> and that piece of advice has always stayed with me. And that is, is that there is, with every crisis, there's always an opportunity. When every door closes, the door, another door opens. You just got to be on the right side of the door. And sometimes you don't know which is the right side of the door, so you have to use your experience to, to, to do this kind of thing. And so, you know, if I look back at my own career in public service, you know, there were highs and there were lows. But generally speaking, uh, I had supportive friends and supportive family who encouraged me to continue to weather whatever there were storms or, or good news and, and, and to make it through uh, whatever kind of adversity that I had, and so uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great opportunity for me to have that kind of uh, learning experience. And I had lost my election in 94, and I wasn't quite sure what I was gonna do, but I had uh, developed good friends and hadn't burned bridges. And as David Pryor knows, not burning bridges is the most important thing you can do in this world, and it's tough in the political system that we have right now, where there are very few bridges left in the modern politics. And so I had not burned a lot of bridges, and I had a very good friend, and he happened to be the majority leader of the United States Senate. He happened to be from Kansas. His name was Dole. And uh, so uh, he, he took a liking to me, and uh, the president actually had called Dole and asked him if uh, he would uh, uh, think it'd be good if uh, Glickman would be nominated to be Secretary of Agriculture to replace Mike Espy. So Dole called me up, and Dole has this great, this great sense of humor, and I understand Dole was the inaugural speaker here at the Clinton uh, Public Policy Group. And so I went to see Dole's office. He says, yeah, Clinton just called. This, I, I almost remember this exactly happened. Clinton just called. He wants to know if you want to be Secretary of Agriculture. I said, yeah, I heard that rumor around. And he looked at me and says, tell me, will this get you out of Kansas forever? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just struck me, and so I said, well, you don't have to worry about me running against you. Uh, and then we had another senator from Kansas whose name was Nancy Cassabon, and God couldn't have beaten this woman. So I wasn't <laughs> particularly worried about that. But, but I, I repeat the fact that not burning the bridges, keeping my lines of communications open, not taking partisanship excessively, made a big difference in my life in terms of moving forward. And I think it's, I, I've made a lot of mistakes, but it's a good lesson that I learned. I know David Pryor has, has, has uh, honored that lesson probably more than you know anybody else that, that I can think of. Um, I would like to kind of jump for a moment in terms of, it is true, it is an interesting change in life to move from years in public service, particularly in elected and appointed service, to being the spokesperson for the major motion picture studios in the United States. I mean, that is a heck of a jump. But my predecessor, Jack Valenti, says, well, it's no big deal because both in the agriculture department and in this job, I do a lot of manure every day. That's you know, his basic line. I told Jack not to use that anymore. I didn't think it was really funny. But uh, uh, I uh, had uh, been at Harvard uh, following in David Pryor's footsteps. And uh, this job opportunity came open. And my son is a film producer in Los Angeles. He's been there for many years. Is with a company called Spyglass Entertainment. And actually it's produced over 30 movies. And so uh, the opportunity came up and I knew Valen Jack Valenti from before. And so I decided, you know what? I wouldn't become president of the American Shoe Association or, or something like that. But I thought, you know what? The movies are a little different. There's something about the movies that are just tad different from every other economic unit in this country. In the first place, the film industry is the face of America worldwide. Last week, I, and I don't want to lot with this high crowd, but I did meet with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I told him that he was probably, he and a guy named Jackie Chan are the 
two most famous Americans in the world. Okay, not George Bush. Maybe Bill Clinton gets close there, but I'm telling you, they don't make it to where Arnold Schwarzenegger or Jackie Chan. And the reason for that is because our entertainment industry, our motion picture industry, our film industry, our television industry, and to some extent our music industry, entertainment is a place where America's face is on the world. You, you don't see, you think about this. Yeah, there are some movies that come from other places in the world. That's just true, I and mean, a lot of them are good. And there are stars that come from other places in the world. But as opposed to most other industries, the film and entertainment industry is, is really a place where America unequivocally continues to lead the world. So, bad, good, or indifferent, it's true. And to give you some background and statistics, um, it is the only industry that has a, we have a positive balance of payment surplus with every single country in the world. Not agriculture, not airplanes, not software, but movies, film and television. Okay. So, the fact of the matter is, it's a big deal. It's America's face in the world. It produces an awful lot of jobs here. And uh, so, therefore, I view this job as, as important. That is, what we do does make a difference, uh, you know, around the world. And I'll give you a little anecdote. Not long ago, I was in India. I went to a film festival there. And I'm, the, the Indian movies, they produce about four times as many movies as we do in this country, Bollywood. And a lot of them are good movies, but most of them are not commercial here in the United States. They play a lot in Europe and in, in Asia. So I wanted to see a multiplex. I wanted to see a new movie house. And so uh, they took me to a movie house, and there's a line around the block, a fairly modern multiplex. And they had a sign in front, and the sign was in Hindi, which I could not read. But the, the line was around most of where the house was. It's a circle of the movie theater, and I asked the... Uh, the manager, I said, well, what's the popular movie here? There were five Indian movies playing one American movie. He said, well, the American movie is the one that's getting the most attention. I said, what's the name of the movie? And he said, the movie is Meet the Fockers. <laughs> okay. Now think about it. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Meet the Fockers. Okay. All right. So here is a movie with kind of a Jewish theme with Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro and Barbara Streisand. And I'm thinking, what, what do these people find interesting about the movie? And he said, but Mr. Glickman, this is a movie about celebration, about happiness, about color, about joy. And he says, this is exactly what our people will like when they go to the movies. And it, it struck me that it is, it is, for whatever reason, nobody else has found that kind of, that, that special place to reach the world that we have done. And not even all the conflicts of the current times. You know, right now, I don't have to tell you that America is not necessarily at the height of its reputational history. And without going into politics on it, the truth of the matter is, is that, that uh, there are reasons why we are not necessarily as beloved as we once were. But they still go to the movies. They still like the American theater, the good and the bad and everything in with it. And it is, it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. You talk about influence and power. In fact, there was a dean at, at the Kennedy School, uh, Joe Nye, who used to talk about soft power. And he and I would talk about the significance of the movies as soft power, as a way to get people uh, interested and, 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 and have a good time. And so I say that to you, that that is one of the reasons why I thought that this was a job that somehow related to the concepts of public service. The other thing is what I find here at home and around the world is by and large people go to the movies to be entertained, not to be lectured to, you know, not to be frightened, but to relax. And uh, most people have enough heartache or stress in their lives that they generally go to just kind of sit and have the theater darkened and, and, and play something that interest them and hopefully will motivate them to some degree, but, 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 but basically to enjoy themselves. Some people say, well, there's not enough seriousness in movies, and there are a lot of serious movies. I was at the Academy Awards and I saw Al Gore win an Academy Award for an inconvenient truth. 
Um, there, were, there was a movie this year called Blood Diamond. Some of you saw it. It was a very serious movie about the West African diamond trade. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, there are, there are serious movies which are thought-provoking, but, but by and large, people go to the movies to relax and, and have a good time. And, uh, and I think that's the most important thing of what we do. And, and, and it doesn't mean that we don't try to do things to uplift people and we don't recognize that we have an impact on culture, which we do have a significant impact on culture. And it doesn't mean that I think that every movie that comes out is, is worthy of winning the Nobel Prize, because it is not. Uh, the movie, which was done very well, the movie Ghost Rider, which was the top selling movie the last two weekends, I doubt that's going to win the Academy Award against you. But it is a movie that, for, for a variety of different reasons, appeals to different folks. And so, one of the things when people come up to me and say, I can't stand the kind of movies that are coming out, I said, if I showed you a list of every movie that came out in 2006, you would see such a variety of movies that you would understand that they appeal to everybody, from a 14-year-old kid to, to uh, a person six times that age who was just going there to, to basically relax. And the, 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 the movies basically have to appeal to this broad generation of people. One of the big challenges that we face is, is that more and more people aren't seeing the movies in traditional ways. More and more people are seeing the movies online. They're seeing a video on demand. They're downloading movies, legally, I hope. Uh, but, but, you know, the internet gives us a great opportunity. The internet is this great democratizing influence, which gives us a great opportunity to give millions of people access to information and entertainment that do not have it now. So we should not view that as a threat, but we recognize that it means that the business model has to change to some degree to get people the information in a new way that, 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 that they're going to be getting. But all of this kind of goes to, to, to basically kind of come full circle in this in the situation is, is that, you know, public service can come in many ways. It can come in elected office, it can come in appointed office, it can come in the private sector. There's a story, I think it was either in today's New York Times about the fact that uh, charitable giving is up considerably over the last couple of years, that people are finding it finally maybe more interesting to engage their society in, in a myriad of different ways. And so there's there's not one way when you go to become involved in public service that is necessarily the right way. And, but I do believe that we all have the obligation, serious obligation. There's more in life than just earning a living. Uh, contributing back is every bit as important. It's much more of what you'll be remembered for than what you actually did to earn your living. So um, just coming here, being here in this institution uh, is, is important for me because I got my start in politics on my own, but I was facilitated, and the catalyst to where I am today was because of Bill Clinton. And, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that I had a mentor or a helper that could facilitate my, my public service career is another thing that everybody does need. So I would close by saying again that uh, there's no real absolute trick to succeeding in this world, whether it's in the private sector or, or in the public sector, but recognizing that, that we all do have an obligation in one way or another to make the world better for each other. And hopefully in this business that I'm in, I can have some influence in that process. Thank you all very much.
way I thought the administration was really trying to help farmers. And uh, frankly, I could take you, I could take you to half Arkansas or Tucker, Arkansas or Gillette, Arkansas, and ask the fellows that there were farmers there, who's the best secretary of agriculture we ever had? And you'd be acclaimed that. And uh, that's something else. And uh, we appreciate everything. We got the best farm bill in 2000 with your help. Carl Willett was there, and you know, and Mary Berry, and uh, I like to think I was, I was the president's appointee to that commission looking at agricultural policy for the new century. That's the best farm bill we ever had. And if we can get another one just like it, we feel like we're, uh, we've done great things. But we do appreciate everything you've done in that respect and many other things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In my case, it would be farming, food stamps, and forestry, and this and that, and everything else. So I once, I, but I would always, I was smart enough, I learned this from David Pryor, I think, I'd put an Arkansas thing up near the top. <laughs> because I figured that, you know, you might read it. So uh, I'll never forget one time I put, uh, I, I'll never forget it, because you can hardly read Clinton's right. The scrawl was just awful. And so uh, uh, I said that I had been in some town east of here to dedicate a water, water and sewer, sewer facility. And he hand wrote a note. Did you stop and talk to Harvey Joe Singer on your way? <laughs> now, uh, uh, this is not to put down our current president, but sometimes I wonder, do you think he would write that kind of note? <laughs> you know, I just saw so you. And there you are. I'm glad to see you. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, I thought Jim would agree everything he knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> Jim's been a great friend of mine. I will echo what you say. I wish we had you back at USDA. Thank you for what you did in your service to agriculture. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. you shouldn't be shy out there. I promised Gary that I would take anything, you know. Hello, Mr. Beckman. I'm Paula Randall Smith of Green Wisdom and Conservation Counts. As the, um, as the fact that we're a media-driven country, and uh, when he was Secretary of Agriculture, conservation was one of the top priorities. And it's not no longer about soil and water anymore, but it's about personal responsibility in all areas of conservation. Water, waste, energy, earth, environment, building green, and our communities. In, in regards to <clears throat> trailers, and in regards to the um, entertainment industry, how much did you, as a, as a president and CEO of the uh, Motion Picture Association, can step forward and, and, and start making a stand for some things like conservation, which is personal responsibility, the only way we can start moving forward in regards to America um, taking responsibility for uh, our, our actions in these areas? Uh, okay, well, that's a good question. Uh, for, first of all, I represent, I'm a trade association, so I represent member companies. So I, I can't force them to do anything they don't want to. I can provide some leadership. And second of all, as you are well aware, these are businesses. And so uh, they, they have stockholders. And so not that they can't have be socially responsible, but I'm not dealing with public service entities out there. I'm dealing with people that are facing quarterly reports and, and analysts and you know everything else in the, in the world. I, I do think that in my, under my dealings, not only with the CEOs and executives of companies, but some of the talent, although I don't deal with the talent very much, there is the recognition that people in this business can have great power and great influence over issues. And, it, and all you have to look at is where do most politicians go when they start running for anything? They go to Southern California. Um, I don't think it's because of the beautiful weather that they run out there myself. But, uh, uh, so, you know, but we're, we're not, we're not a, a social movement either, we're, we're businesses. But we also have great ability to influence, great power, and that comes from responsibility as well. And so, you know, it, it, I, I would say that I, I accept your question, and, uh, you know, it depends on what the issue is. You have an awful lot of people in this business who are on the progressive side of the 
social and political scheme, although not everybody is, uh, to, to you know, come up with ideas. But, but I, I don't want to imply to you that this is, this, is, this is business, this is not politics. They're out to produce movies and television shows that are going to make money, and hopefully in the process they do responsible things as well. But I think it, I, mean, I, I recognize the power of the media, and obviously film and television is part of the media. And, uh, you know, they're, they're an awful. The classic example is the rising amount of documentaries that are being done. And a lot of you have seen these documentaries lately. And there are, I saw one not long ago, Who Killed the Electric Car, the Gore movie. There are an awful lot of things that, that are coming out now because they're, they're popular, they have to sell. And so, you know, ultimately, the business will survive only if people go buy tickets to them. And so part of the responsibility is to make good stuff, and part of the responsibility is for people to buy stuff too. So that would be my best answer. Question over here. Mr. Glickman, you said you weren't afraid of getting some of the more ticky issues, and I've got a few questions, and so if anybody runs out, I can come up with a few extras. All right, we'll start with one. We'll start with one. Oh, well, no, just go on. If, as you stated in February of 2006, DRM is intended to help a casual, honest user consume media that's produced under the various members of the trade organization. Should DRM be more restrictive in legal rights from traditional American intellectual property law? Okay, Th this is, I better explain this to you because it <laughs> gets very complicated. DRM means Digital Rights Management. And these are the tools and techniques that are associated with, with products like DVDs and CDs to some extent, and which prevent them from basically unlimited copy. And one of the issues that we're talking about is how to give consumers uh, the ability to get movies or music the way they want it, when they want it, and how they want it. And still not have a situation where the creator comes up with some idea and sells it, people can come and copy it willy-nilly without any form of compensation whatsoever. I mean, uh, you know, most of our creative works in our society, whether it's publishing, books, or pharmaceuticals, or movies, happen because the Constitution and the statutes guarantee intellectual property right protection. So that if you invent something, nobody can just steal it and, and go with it. Now, the, the question's a good question because, you know, basically implies with modern technological techniques, it may be easier or more difficult at times to protect this kind of property. And we're wrestling with that now. But, but I would say that, 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 and I think that, yeah, new technology makes it easier and should make it easier for people, consumers, to be able to have access to more in, in an easier way. But you also have to find a way to protect that from theft. And so that's the, that's the trick, that we, the line that we walk down. Let's see, Dave Pryor. Mr. Secretary, once again, thank you for being here. We're honored to be here. Uh, Michael, would you please stand up? I want to reintroduce you to someone, Mr. Secretary. This man is Michael Hinton. And in, when he was in Newton, Kansas, in the third grade, you spoke to his class. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Secretary, he is now a citizen of Arkansas, gainfully employed, and he wanted to come this evening to see if there had been any improvement, and he thinks there was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where were you in school? Santa Fe Middle Middle State? St. Mary. St. Mary. On, I think, Yeah. Did I have more hair in there? Or did you <laughs> I did. I had the sunflower on my lapel, which I wore every day until the voters of my district had other ideas for my career than that sunflower went on before the next day. <laughs> I still have like, a love for Kansas in my heart. But uh, anyway, it's great to see you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Yeah. Thank you as well. Newton, Kansas was on the main line of the Santa Fe Railroad. And it was it was just to give you some idea, it was supposedly the metropolis going to be the metropolis in Kansas, but the, uh, the the fathers of that town did not want to come up with improvements. So they went south 20 miles to Wichita. Got a question right here. I'm a movie lover, but you mentioned that the movies being placed in America. I'm concerned 
about the kind of violent movies that we export so much of. Is this the place that you really want to show? Well, I think it's a good question. But I think that, you again, if you look at the uh, total panoply of movies that are out there, I mean, there are just all types. There's movies with violence. There's no question of violence, uh, some violence sells in our society. But, uh, you know, you take a movie like A Little Miss Sunshine, there's no violence in it, you know. Uh, I mean, the, the, you, have, you have a mixed variety of movies. And some have violence and some don't. Violence has been one way or the other kind of a part of the American culture for a couple hundred years. And so that, that's going to seep into the, 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 the culture, the popular culture. But in, in the ratings process, violence is a factor on ratings. For example, the movie that won the Academy Award this year, The Departed, is a very violent movie. It was rated R and appropriately rated. And, um, you know, you know it was, in some sense, it was almost a spoof on violence. There was so much there. But, but yeah, there are an awful lot of people who don't like violent conduct in movies. And we also run the rating system. And while it's an imperfect way, its goal is to let people know, parents especially, what what's the content of movies so they can advise their kids. Some parents take go, you know, understand it, look at it, use it as a tool. Others don't. But uh, but you know, we it, we have a whole. It's it's funny. We we um, there are just a lot of different interests in in, in, in American media, and certainly the violence theme runs through it, but it is not the exclusive thing that is, uh, is, you know, is part of the American culture. You know, I remember last year that two of the most favorite movies were Napoleon Dynamite and Sideways. Neither of those were violent movies. A lot of the violent movies tend to get a lot of uh, shtick, but you take a movie like Pirates of the Caribbean, which was a PG-13 movie, which I thought was very good. It was the biggest selling movie last year, made a billion dollars at home and worldwide. It was a fairly violent movie, actually. It may not be the kind of violence you're talking about, you know. So, you know, while I, I do understand that there are concerns about the creative process, I, I, I'm fearful about treading and telling people what kind of movies they, they ought to do. I think that's the American scene ought to keep that kind of censorship away. The way it happens is you have to vote, and if you don't vote by going to those movies, then people will make different kind of movies. There's also no question that a big chunk of people going to films in recent years have been younger uh, moviegoers, um, particularly the ages of like 13 to 30, and even within that group, probably 13 to 20 are a big chunk of people who go to movies. You've all been to the movies uh, on weekends. You see who tends to go, and, and you know, by and large, that's the audience. That the big part of the audience is, is predictable moviegoers. So, uh, uh, in order to keep those people going, uh, you know, the, the, the marketplace prepares product that those folks want to see. You can argue, well, we ought to be doing a better job than we're doing. And I think you're probably right. We could be doing a better job than we're doing. But still, it's, a, it's, it's the private sector at work, too. If I can follow up with a question on that. Uh, the, the issue raised here, I think, is the issue of product liability. Uh, you did an incredible job uh, under the Agricultural Department of ensuring food safety and that kind of issue. And I think the things that have been, been shown you know, that there are direct uh, correlations between children's exposure to violence and film, video, TV. Another one is the tobacco issue. Uh, the new data suggests that 390,000 children become smokers directly as a result of uh, their exposure to PG-13 and below type movies. Uh, so the issue comes up, if these things in fact have a toxic effect on children, isn't there an additional uh, pressure or need that is greater than the issues that you've raised about uh, free expression and that kind of thing? Well, I frankly put free expression pretty close to the top of uh, you know, what the American media is all about. Because often when you go down one road to say, well, this is not good for you, we ought to restrict that content. The next, the next way you turn, somebody else is saying, this idea is not so good for you either. You might get sick about this idea. So you have to be really careful before you go down the road. Now, not saying that, if you want to talk about the smoking issue, I'm having lost both my parents to lung cancer. I'm not, and I don't smoke. 
And I do believe that our industry needs to be doing more than it's currently doing to discourage smoking in the movies. And we're looking at a variety of ways to do it. do that. Uh, uh, the director of the movie The Devil Wears Prada, and many of you saw that movie here. Now one could argue that would be a movie, the fashion industry in New York, where there would be a logical place where people would smoke. No smoking in that movie at all. So a lot of directors, in fact, do that uh, because they, they, they're involved. There are a lot of movies where smoking has historical references. If you have a movie in a foxhole in World War II, it would probably be foolish not to think they're smoking because our government supplied cigarettes to the troops as part of their, their meal packets and everything else. So, I mean, you know, it, it, but at the same time, to try to reduce the amount of gratuitous smoking uh, is, makes sense. And I, 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 we're we're going to work on that. We're going to make some announcements in the fairly near future about ways to try to help that process along. But I will tell you this. Be, be, be careful about the government proscribing content about what ought to be in the movies. I mean, even though something seems like a public health issue, uh, uh, there are an awful lot of people who have their own ideas about what's going to make us happy and healthy, and I just as soon not have the government tell us what to do here. In, in the not-so-distant future, traditional print media is going to be more heavily reliant on video via the web to deliver content such as the New York Times is now doing uh, obituaries uh, online and it's actually a refreshing uh, change to traditional, traditional print. Um, what sections or topics do you think would most benefit from delivery over the internet as opposed to being in print? Uh, well, I'm not in that publishing business so I can't tell you, but I, I can tell you this, people are not reading newspapers very much anymore. Maybe they local papers read, but I, in my own hometown of Wichita it used to be the highest saturation newspaper in the United States. And just newspapers are just not read very much anymore. So we've got to get people to read and understand what's happening to them. And the web offers that kind of you know opportunity. I saw the publisher of the New York Times said that he didn't know if 10 years from now they would even be publishing the New York Times. They would all be published online. Uh, you know, I, I'm a traditionalist. That bothers me a little bit. I like the sense of unity that a newspaper provides, but the web is a great democratizer, and it allows an awful lot of people in, to participate in the media, and, and so my guess is, is that you're going to see about, in, in 10 or 15 years, I'll bet you see most of what we see in newspapers online, and you know, what, what, what we have to do is to make sure that people are getting some common source of information from somebody. I'll go on my high horse right now. I still watch the evening news, uh, the, the network news. Why? Because I like to see things that I don't know anything about. That enriches me. The one disturbing thing about the changes in the web is we're all only watching things that we want to watch. Okay. And that's a little bit troubling because uh, you just go in like-minded circles and you're not terribly enriched and you don't see other points of view. Uh, that's the nice thing about reading the newspaper open it up and you can see a million different things. And so it's just a, it's a worry that as we go to an all web-based society, we don't end up with little communities and all they are doing is sharing their own preconceived or prehistoric belief systems. Just think it has to be something to be careful about. So much, Mr. Gordon. Um, I actually am from Hazen. I'm 17 years old. My name is Gordon Compechna. I represent the youth from all of Arkansas. Well, in an organization called the Yes Youth Extinguishing Smoking. And I was actually here to, I was asked here to speak about tobacco in the movies, the movie industry. And first of all, I would like to thank you for taking a stand and assuming the responsibility and making a statement here about tobacco and tobacco use in movies. It really touched me that you, would, you took that stand and didn't avoid it in any possible way. I would like to present you with an actual gathering of petitions and letters from students from all over Arkansas that are against or are for better ratings on tobacco or tobacco products used in movies and for a tobacco-free America eventually. These students range from any age group, and I do believe I have representation here with me today. And I, I do believe that we do represent Arkansas well, 
and that our youth are standing up for what we believe in. And if you would please take these petitions. Thank you. For sure. Yeah. These horror movies, terrible. 
But, uh, sorry, I do have uh, two questions. I kind of go together. Could you just give us a, a kind of glimpse into your daily schedule when you're in Hollywood, kind of what you do? Well, I'm mostly in Washington. And, all right, and then I was, actually, my follow up is going to be can you discuss some of your lobbying efforts? Uh, exactly what do you lobby for? Uh, well, basically, my goal is to try to represent the industry in Congress and in governments around the world. 60% I mean, of the revenues of our business are outside the United States. And we get about nine and a half billion dollars worth of box office tickets on theaters in the U.S. and about 15 billion dollars around the world outside the U.S. So uh, you begin to see the impact of movies in terms of, and that's just box office. I'm not talking about DVDs or home video and that kind of thing. So I, you know, spend most of my time trying to educate the Hill about uh, the significance and importance of the industry and our positions on all of them. And obviously there are other people like me doing the same thing in different kind of perspectives and directions. When I'm back in LA, I'm usually not, you know, people come up to me, I have to tell you, I've had a lot of people come up and say, you have the greatest job in the world. And they think I have lunch with Angelina Jolie. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> what is this? You know, no, it's not like that at all. I mean, I, this is a business and I work to, to kind of promote the, the business and business related issues of, of our companies, whether it's in LA, whether it's in state capitals around the country, uh, whether it's in Washington, or whether it's worldwide. I want to mention one other thing you're talking about, about parents. Parents have a great deal of responsibility. Any of you notice there's an ad campaign running on cable called tvboss.org? Okay. This is a goal to try to get parents to use the blocking tools they have available at their television sets, whether it's cable or satellite or broadcast, <coughs> to restrict viewing time. Right now, about 10% of the parents use these blocking tools. Now, there are a lot of reasons why it may not be convenient to do it, or sometimes parents aren't home or everything else. But, but what we're trying to do is to let parents know they have it in their power to make a lot of difference in their kids' lives, and they have to become engaged. Now, I realize that a lot of parents, they see the, the, the VCR at 12 o'clock flashing all the time, and they don't know how to even do this stuff very well. And so we're trying to educate them that it's not so complicated as, as you think it is. But, but the truth of the matter is, is that the industry has some responsibility, but parents have a lot of responsibility as well to engage what their kids are doing. And some do a very good job. And I realize that the, the, the family situation is not what it was 40 or 50 or 60 years ago. It's different. But the goal is to recognize that the, TV's, the TV does give parents a lot of power. It's modern technology. And it's not that difficult to use those black and well, first of all, let's uh, let's give a big round of applause. We have a reception following, but before we get up, the, I'm going to use my dean's prerogative here and ask the one question. You were at the Oscars. We were watching the television. It seemed to me that there was this huge frenzy about Al Gore and the inconvenient truth. That the whole Oscars about Al Gore being there, Al Gore winning, the song, beating the songs of the Dream Girls for best song. Um, what does the inconvenient truth mean to your friend Al Gore and what do you see about his future? Well, I, you know, I mean, it was a big thing for him. There's no question about it. You know, he took this idea and it, it's, it's, uh, had a, it's, I think it's either the first or second biggest documentary that's ever been shown in terms of gross. And it's done well around the world. And it certainly has continued to enhance uh, this, this concept that citizen activism can make a difference, particularly on the environment. It's had, a, I think, a significant impact. And what it's done is legitimize the debate a lot. So now you see. You see, normal corporations are saying we've got to do something about this. It's become part of it. Did you see that uh, a private equity group just bought this very large coal company in Texas, TXU, and it's part of the deal is, is that to get them to stop building coal fire plants in the state. It's, you know, it's a profound type of thing. And I think Gore just kind of pre predated that effort. I know him. I was in the house with him. He was elected the same year as I was. And he's been working this issue for 30 years, certainly. So I think it was an important uh, ratification by that group that this was a big movie. But, but, but I think it's the fact is the country is very generally supportive of him. And the naysayers now believe that what he's saying is 
you know, it, it, it is, is largely true. I mean, I don't know what his future plans are, and he hasn't asked me, and I haven't told him. But I think, that he, <laughs> but I do think that he has shown how the power of citizen activism. And yeah, you could say, well, he was vice president. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of resources. He could do a lot of things. I know a lot of ex-politicians, not and Gordon or Clinton, are not among those who have not used their previous ability to to fight for for the right kinds of things. So I think. Again, closing on the subject of public service, I think that Al Gore is the epitome of public service. He's taken this, he's done the right thing with it, he's pushed an issue that people can care about. Yeah, his, he, uh, his is a more cosmic issue, but that doesn't mean that all of us can't engage in some similar way to what, what he's done. So. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.